everybody. How's everybody doing this morning? I want to look in John chapter 1 for just a minute this morning. And in John chapter 1, verse 1 through 5, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was God, he was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. And if you turn over to Psalms uh, 139, verse 13 and 14, it says, For you created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And in Romans, I can probably get there faster than most of you because i got little bark markers in here. In Romans 1, oops, there I spoke too soon. I didn't get there. Romans 1, verse 20, it says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. Now, there's a lot of there's a lot more references elsewhere in the Bible, but in those particular verses, there's a lot of references that keep saying the word "made." And what does "made" mean? What is a synonym for "made"? I said it one time. Who said that? Created, Created. creation, creation. God was there from the beginning. He was there from the beginning. Jesus was there from the beginning. It was creation. These words are in common with each other. Creation is defined as defined as cause to be designed with a new shape or form. Started, built up, established. And here's a really a key one in my opinion. It's the laying of a foundation. Creation is. The laying of the foundation. God laid the creation foundation for us. And he's still with us today. Let's pray this morning. Father, we lift up our praise to you this morning. And we're in awe of all you do for us. And awe of the power you have that you created. And everything we see and everything we do was created by you, Father. And we're, we are just in, just in adoration of you. And, Father, we love you for all you do for us and all you have done for us in the past. Father, we have some that are ill. We'd ask you to comfort them and, and bless them. And be with us this morning through our service. Be with our song service this morning. Let it be our worship to you. Bless those that are not here. Bless those that are traveling. Keep all of them safe. And just be with Ross this morning as he brings us the message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, um, <laughs> that'll come later. Uh, so, one of the things, uh, you know, there's, there's something, you know, coming up here soon that people get kind of uh, excited about, some people, you have Valentine's Day. So, um, you know, that you can think of the, the scripture, you know, 1 Corinthians 13, where all the love uh, scriptures are. But this is something that popped up in my feed just the, the other day. And so in, in verse 4 of chapter 13, it has the love is patient, love is kind, it is not jealous, love does not brag, it is not arrogant. It, it, it gets really important at this point. <laughs> it does not act disgracefully, it does not seek its own benefit, it is not provoked, does not keep an account of wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with truth. God's truth, not your personal truth. It's a bunch of hooey. And it keeps every confidence it believes, all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Let's stand, and we're going to sing something that has nothing to do with any of that. Open up the heavens. <laughs>
So Psalm 103:19 says, "The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his sovereignty rules over all." And then in Philippians 4:4 4, 4, it tells us, "Rejoice in the Lord always." Again, I will say, "Rejoice." Let's sing, "Rejoice, the Lord is king."
Let's pray. Our precious Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this opportunity that we have to be able to gather together as brothers and sisters in Christ. And dear God, just help us today just to focus upon your creation, your mighty creation, the creation that you have made for us. And dear God, we pray for those today that are hurting. We think of the Larson family today. We lift them up to you. We just pray, dear God, for healing. And there's others that are in our, our church congregation that too are hurting. And we pray for each one of them as they go through this day and the days to come. But right now, dear God, we thank you for Ross. We just ask that you'll give him the words to speak as we continue our time of worship here. We pray all these things now in your precious name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. As you're wandering back towards your, your seats, um, you know, the, one of the questions that kind of came to mind as I, was, as I was working through this, I think it'll make sense as we get into it, but the question is, you know, how do you view the past, right? Um, a lot of times you can run across this idea like, oh, the past should stay in the past, right? We, we kind of try to like box it up and, and put it off. There, there are, you know, lessons we can learn. We can see, oh, how were they successful? Or, ooh, we should avoid that failure, right? We try to learn from the, the mistakes and the things that went well in the past, but we try to keep it kind of separate. We don't like to connected too much to today, partly because, you know, while we think we can look at hindsight and learn from it, we, you know, we can't grasp all of history. And so we try to, we try to kind of portion it up, package it up, these little bites, little history lessons. Um, but a lot of times we, we keep it in the past. We don't, we don't want it to be too impactful about today. And I think sometimes as Christians we do this with the Bible as well, right? We take some of the, the, the history and the lessons that are in it and we kind of say, oh yeah, that's, that's true, right? You know, that's, that is history, that is accurate, but it's, it's kind of its own thing. We kind of try to keep it separate, keep it kind of closed off. Um, but I think as we, as we look at today, we'll see one of those things is creation, right? We think of creation as something that, yeah, it, it happened, right? And we acknowledge, oh, yeah, Genesis 1, God created, that's how we got here, right? So we, we kind of see a connection there and that without creation, we wouldn't be here. But we kind of keep it separate. We try to, you know, it's this thing that happened once in the past, but this idea of God as creator and creation, it doesn't always have a, a, an ongoing impact for us. Um, but we're going to look at today, multiple passages today where the, the writers in the Bible kept, keep going back to creation. Creation as an idea, God as creator isn't something that was just, just a historical reality. It was an ongoing uh, foundation for a lot of their theology, a lot of their belief and their trust in God came from him as creator. And when you're, when you're looking through the Bible and you're trying to put some of the pieces together and build, you build your beliefs, there's a, you know, different methods, different systems of doing that. And one of them is called, they call it biblical theology. And we're going to do a little bit of biblical theology today. And one of the main points of biblical theology is to look through all of Scripture and connect themes and threads and ideas as they go through it. Because uh, the Bible is a very diverse book. Uh, and as uh, Andreas uh, Kostenberger puts it, one of the main points of biblical theology is to take all of that diversity that we see in the Bible, different authors, different times, different, different types of literature, different reasons for writing, different audiences, and take all of that diversity and see how it is still a unified message. And we're going to see that with, with creation today. As we go, we're going to go, uh, in brief stops, we're going to go from Genesis to Revelation today and see how creation weaves itself through the whole Bible. 
right? It isn't just those first two pages in Genesis that creation comes up. Uh, it is used over and over again as something that is meant to challenge God's people to put their hope and their trust in him. And so, of course, we're, we're going to start at the place that makes the most sense when talking about creation. We're going to start in Genesis 1. Um, and the, one, of the, one of the books I was reading, they put it, it's interesting that with, you know, with Genesis 1, right, before the Bible gets into these specific stories about specific people, right, you know, pretty quickly from the first cut from Genesis, we get into Noah and Abram and all these very specific stories. But these first two chapters, we get this perspective of all of creation. We get, we get a glimpse, a very, you know, zoomed out, wide angle glimpse of, of what's going on. And so we're going to read just a, f- a, a few verses in Genesis 1. We're not going to, you know, don't have time to just read, ev- read it all today. Um, but I'm going to start with uh, Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, and then I'm going to skip to the end of the chapter and start with verse 31. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then to verse 31. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So that, that phrase, that idea that as, as God creates each day, he like, saw that it was good. It was good. Here at the, at, the, at the end, he says it was very good. And so when you see these kind of these repeated phrases and ideas in a passage like that, it's, you know, should be like a little light bulb goes off. Like, oh, wait a minute, this is probably important if they keep repeating it like this. And part of what uh, Moses is trying to communicate here when he's talking about creation is that what God created was good, right? It wasn't evil. It wasn't chaos. It wasn't partial, right? God didn't do half the job, right? He didn't cut corners. He didn't let things just kind of slide past. What God created is, is good and complete and, and orderly as he goes through this. Um, and this, this, again, this concept of God as creator, we, we get these first couple chapters here in Genesis, but then that is a, a foundation that is, is built on throughout the rest of the Bible, and the, I think this is one of, those, again, one of those things where we try to kind of put the creation in, in, a, in a historical box, right? We, you know, we acknowledge it happened. Sure, it's true. But we don't always think about what that means for us today and how God as creator really gives us a source of hope and trust, not just about the past, but about the present and about the future. And that's, that's what we're going to keep seeing as we go through these other, other passages, um, is how, how the writers of, the, of both the Old and the New Testament keep looking back to creation for, for hope, for peace, for, for inspiration. And so um, one of the other things that's very different about creation in, as recorded here, and as, as it happened, right? So many other creation myths from, from ancient times, right? It, it almost feels like an accident. You know, the gods, oops, oops I, m- I messed up, and now there's, there's people here. Or there was a, it was an afterthought, or they were simply looking for slaves to make their jobs easier, right? And then they would, a lot of the, again, the, the other ancient creation myths is that the gods, after they create it, kind of distance themselves from their creation, right? They're like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here maybe if you do some things to appease me, but they're not really involved anymore. And the, the Bible paints a very different picture of God and creation and his involvement. And to, to kind of get an idea of what that looks like, we're going to go to Job 38 and 39 and look at a few verses there. And I know, you know, it wasn't too long ago that, you know, Kyle finished up his, you know, his series on these wisdom books. So I'm not, it's not going to be a whole 
you know, sermon from these verses again, because Kyle just did that. But it, I, want, I wanted to look at because it really calls out this idea that God is still involved in his creation. He hasn't stepped away. You know, he, he's not an absentee creator. Right? He hasn't checked out. And um, you know, the, for the you know, quick recap with Job, right? Man, of, man who's following God, one of God's servants, you know, disaster happens. God allows disaster to happen, allows Satan to come and just bring all kinds of pain and destruction to Job's life. His friends show up, and they, they go back and forth for over 30 chapters about what, what Job must have done wrong, or they question what, or what God has been doing, and it, and it goes back and forth. And after a while, after all that goes on, God shows up and says, hold on, guys, you, you've missed the boat. You, know, you, you are so far off in understanding who I am and how I work and what it means for me to be here today. And so I found it, re- it's real interesting, the first challenge that, that God gives to Job, he, he does all these questions, but the very first one from Job 38, four, he says, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. So the very first thing God challenges Job with is creation. He says, excuse me, Job, did, did you create all of this? Did you make the earth and the sun and the moon and the stars and make it all work together? Was that you, Job? Did I, did I miss that somewhere? It's like, so the very first thing he challenges Job with is creation. He says, I, I made this. Did you? Did you do this, Job? And Again, uh, especially in the in the ancient Near East, right? There all these all these gods that went around. They were often very so very disconnected, but God doesn't just leave it at oh I, I'm powerful enough to have made all of this, Job. I'm also still part of it. I'm connected to my creation. I haven't left it or abandoned it. Um, so because that's part of what Job has been saying in some of his responses to his friends was is kind of questioning what God's God's justice or what if is God really care is he really here and one of the things that um, in verse 12 uh, God speaks to his ongoing involvement he says have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place so he, so God is building from yet. Yes, I created it, but I also sustain it. That sunrise every morning, yeah, that, that's me. Job, are, are you doing that, Job? Are you in charge of the sunrise? Can you make that happen? Can I take a day off, Job, and you do that? So he's, he's reminding Job, no, I am still here. I am still involved in everyday life. I, I care about my creation. I sustain it and keep it going. And then the, uh, the second part of chapter 38, he goes into multiple examples about like all of the weather and the, all of the phenomena to go with that. He asks Job, oh, do you know where the hail comes from? Do you keep all the snow up in the sky? Do you control the storms and the rain and the wind? And he goes on and on reminding Job that I am very much involved in what's going on in this world. I have not abandoned it. I have not abandoned you. And then even in, as he goes on in chapter 39, he, he gives a few examples of how he's involved in, in the, you know, not just in you know, nature, in the storms and the atmosphere and the dawn, but also in the animals. And I'm just going to read three verses that he, where he introduces those ideas real quick, um, and it's verse one, says, do you, in chapter 39, do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Do you observe the calving of the does? And verse five, who has let the wild donkey go free? Who has loosed the bonds of the swift donkey? And then verse 19, do you give the horse his might? Do you clothe his n- neck with a mane? So God keeps talking about creation and he keeps challenging 
Job with this idea that, did, did you make the donkey free? Did you give the horse his power and his mane? Did, do you know how all of this works, Job? No, right? It's kind of the implied answer for all of them because God's like, no, I'm the creator. I'm the one that designed and made all this. I'm the one that keeps it going. I'm the one who knows everything that is going on and is involved in all of my creation. How, how dare you, Job, how dare you imply that I've been unjust? How dare you imply that maybe I don't quite understand what's going on? And, he, and this, this, this challenge that Job just trusts me. You can trust me because I'm involved. Right? I am the creator and sustainer of all of this and more, right? It's, it's, it's not even like, you know, these couple chapters are supposed to be a complete picture of all creation, right? It's like, if I control all of this, Job, if I'm involved in all of this, trust me. Do, I'm not, I'm not unjust. I'm not distant. I'm not disconnected from what's going on. I, Job, I see your life. If I see all these other little details, Job, I, I see your suffering. I know your suffering. I know what's going on. Trust me. And the, it, as, as creation and this idea and this thread, this theme, keep keeps going, keeps building, right? We've gone from, oh, the, the act of creation to God is still involved in creation. Um, we're we're going to keep looking one more passage in the Old Testament where God speaks about new creation. Um, and that's going to be in Isaiah 65. Um, and, you know, I, Isaiah, he, he talks about, all, you know, it's a, Big book talks about all kinds of things, but specifically here in chapter 65, right? He starts talking about how, hey, Israel, don't, don't worry. I know you see people all around you who, who, who are doing evil, who are rejecting me. I'm, I'm, I'm going to judge them. Judgment is coming, right? So, um, but then he doesn't, he doesn't just talk about judgment. He also talks about how he will bless and care for his people. And he talks about providing abundance and blessing and peace for them. And then it kind of takes a little, a little bit of a different turn. It, he gets very specific. He says, I'm going to do this with a new creation. And I'm going to start reading in, in verse 17 of Isaiah 65. He says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die a hundred years old, and the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, and dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy and all my holy mountain, says the Lord. So Isaiah, God speaking to Isaiah, um, he, he gives this picture of how he is going to bless and provide for his people. And it goes right back to creation. 
and in this case, a new creation. Um, during this time with, with when Isaiah is writing, right, it's, it's a very troubling time for the people of Israel, right? It's the kingdom split. There's threats from outside. Um, pretty soon, you know, the, even Judah, the southern kingdom, is going to be in captivity in Babylon. We've, we've got all of these struggles going on. And, but Isaiah is, is, is writing, is recording God's words to say, trust me. My people need to trust me because I, I, will, I will judge the evil. I will take care of that. I will bless and care for and provide for my people. And I will do that ultimately with a new creation where all of the, you know, a lot of the, the struggles and the pains that we see in this world, he's like, I'm going to take care of that, right? Your work won't be in vain. You know, people will have long lives. There won't be the, the hurt and the sorrow. And people who live in this new creation, people, God's people who experience this, they will describe it just like God described creation in Genesis 1. They will say it is good. And they will, they will get to live in it. And they will talk about, you know, I, I love verse 24. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. Right? God will be with them. He'll be, you know, right there with them. And it's, it's, it's not going to be like the world feels like right now, right? With, with <laughs> wars and threats of wars and strife and stress and pandemic. And right? the new creation won't be like that at all. And so Isaiah is, is wanting to communicate hope to God's people, but also a reminder of God's power. The God who created all of this you know, back in Genesis 1 is, has the power and the might and the plan to make it all new again. Right, this didn't exhaust his power. You know, creation did not wear God out as if he can't do it again. And so it's, it's a hope for God's people in a time that is yet to come. And that's, that's so important to remember that um, is hope. Right? And the, the writers in the, in, in the Bible, they keep turning to creation and God as creator, as a source of hope and peace so that God's people, when, when things don't make sense, right, like they did for Job, Job didn't understand what was going on. You know, when Isaiah is writing this for, for the Israelites, right, they, they, they don't understand everything that's going on. There's, there's threats, there's things are falling apart in Israel. Um, it says when, when things don't make sense, remember I am God, the creator. I am God, the sustainer of creation. And I'm the God of a new creation yet to come. My power hasn't changed. My abilities haven't changed. Trust in me. Put your hope in me. Um, because what, what greater thing could we and could they, as, it, as I, like Isaiah was right, could they put their hope in than the, than the creator? Right? What, what greater power, what greater um, future is there than to put your hope and trust in the God who made everything, sustains it, and plans on making a new creation for his people to be in again? And so again, like I said, the, with biblical theology, you're trying, to, you're trying to track these threads and these themes through the, through the whole Bible. And there are so many more passages we could look at in, in the Old Testament that talk about creation over and over again. Um, you know, Ray read from Psalm 139 earlier, right? Which is, which is an amazing chapter talking about God as creator and how he's involved in his creation, how he cares for his people 
how he sees us and is involved. But at this point, we're going we're gonna to break from the Old Testament and get into the New Testament, um, because again, even as we get historically further away from creation, right, you know, further and further in history, it, God's people still keep looking back to creation. And like Ray read in John 1, right, the, the Gospels especially record many things that tie Jesus as creator. It's one of the most repeated examples of Jesus is God. It's Jesus as creator, Jesus as having power over creation. And so the, the story we're going to look at from, for, from Jesus' life is in Mark chapter 4. You know, and this is fairly early on in, in Jesus' public ministry. He's been, he's been teaching. He's been, you know, going through with parable, parables, trying to teach the people, teach his disciples. And particularly here in Mark chapter 4, he's been doing that probably all day. And he's probably exhausted, right? Um, I know if I've, um, any, any teachers in here after a day of teaching all day, you know, you're exhausted. Um, so Jesus has been doing that all day, and at the end of the day, he, he wants to take a break, and they're going to they're gonna change where they're at. And so we're going to read uh, Mark chapter 4, uh, starting in verse 35, just a, a short story. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? If Job and all those questions that God poses to Job, right, the, the, this, this, that discourse is kind of like a, a mental exercise and a mental challenge about creation and creator. In Jesus, we have all of those questions personified. Job, or God challenged Job about storms, or do you control them? Do you, do you track the snow and the wind and the rain and the hail? You, and then now we see creator on earth controlling the wind and the storm. So those, those very questions that God was asking Job, Jesus is here saying, yes, that's me. I'm the one who, con who creates. I'm the one who controls creation. And I remember, you know, over the years reading this and always struggling with why does Jesus ask them that? At the end, he says, you know, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? In some ways, it can kind of seem like a little harsh, right? You just, you know, they're like, well, of course they were afraid. There was a big storm. But they, they, they didn't yet understand from Jesus' teaching they could have already, because otherwise I don't think Jesus would have asked them like that, right? But th they didn't yet understand from Jesus' teaching that they were with the Creator. And, and the Creator doesn't fear his creation, right? We as humans, yeah, we, we fear creation. We fear the storms and the wind because they are way more powerful than we are, right? And, especially out here, we're reminded of that on a regular basis, right? <laughs> that, that these storms come and they are so much bigger than we are. You know, there's nothing we can do about them. 
other than, you know, buy extra groceries and hope the heater works, right? Or be prepared for whatever's coming, up, coming in, put the cars in the garage, whatever, right? We, we can't stop creation. We can't control creation. But the creator he doesn't have any fear of creation. Jesus is in charge of creation. He's in, he's, like I said, the, the personification of all those arguments from Job, all those questions about what, what do you control, Job? Jesus lives it. He is the answer to those questions. And so when Jesus speaks the, that little part of creation, the storm there on the sea, goes back to peace. It kind of goes back to the way things were back in Genesis 1, right? Order is restored. Peace comes and creation in that short little glimpse is, is seen once again as good. And just like Jesus challenged his disciples to say, hey, trust me. <laughs> You're with me. I'm the creator. Don't have such little faith. It's kind of a reminder for, for us today. Okay, you know, Jesus isn't physically with us, you know, next to us like, like when he was here on earth, but we're in the creator's hands. You know, we don't need to fear creation, even though it is bigger than us, stronger than us, and, and we can get swept up in it sometimes, right? We, can, we put our hope and trust in the creator who is bigger than the storm, who's bigger than anything else going on around us. And he is our, our hope and our peace and our comfort. And the, um, this, it was, so this was Jesus validating all of his teachings. He's like, you guys should already be believing in me because of what I've taught you. But I also just demonstrated to you who I am and since cre in creation it was such a big part of the Old Testament and, and the writings and the beliefs there, his disciples, that's, that's what they ask, who is this? Because they know only God controls creation. So they get it, and that's why, Mar that's why we have it here in Mark, right? Is it's like this is tying Jesus to that thread that we've, we saw all through the Old Testament of creator and, cre and God as creator. And um, as that, that theme just continues to develop in, even in the New Testament, we're going to look at Romans chapter 8 next. And again, just a, a, you know, some context there as if we're kind of you know, jumping right into the middle of a book. Right? So far in Romans, Paul has covered a lot of territory. Right? He's, he's talked about sin, righteousness, faith, the Christian life. And here in chapter 8, he starts talking about, about that Christian life a little bit more and how it looks, and that we are free from condemnation, free from, you know, uh, our sinful flesh and, how, and what that comes with originally. And he says we're this because we're, we've been adopted into God's family. We're heirs with Christ. And he, he at the end of chapter 8, or partway through chapter 8, he kind of takes almost a little detour. And it can kind of feel out of place um, if, at first, because he starts talking about, he, he, go, he goes from, if we're heirs with Christ, we're going to suffer like Christ did, because we, we identify with Christ, Christ suffered, we can expect suffering. But then he takes this idea of suffering, and he goes a little, I don't know, a little deeper than just us as people. And that starts in uh, verse 18 of, of Romans 8. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. 
and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoptions as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Paul is, 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 is kind of this, this, this little bit of this transition about from suffering with Christ. He then reminds uh, Christians, he reminds us, he was reminding the Romans, right, who, who he was writing to, that Jesus coming to earth isn't just a change for human souls and mankind. He's looking ahead to the same thing Isaiah was talking about. He's looking ahead towards new creation. Where the, in verse 21, it, where he said that the creation is waiting to be set free from its bondage to corruption, right? Where he's, he says that creation is going to be changed because of Jesus. And he, he touches on a, a, a couple key things here is that um, you know, all of creation is, is broken and suffering because of what happened in the Garden of Eden. Right? Everything that God set and is good got a little twisted, a little broken, and all of creation is is suffering that now. But then he, he goes on and talks about hope, which might sound like a familiar word because we've talked about it quite a bit already, right? Hope in creation. And he talks about how there's, there's this key aspect of hope. We don't hope for that which we have. Hope, hope is looking ahead, right? Hope is looking for things that aren't quite here yet, but we know are coming. And specifically, he talks about we wait eagerly for our adoptions as sons. And it, it kind of contrasts a little bit early in the chapter. He says, we have been adopted already. So it, it's this kind of already and not yet aspect of adoption that Paul's talking about here. He says, you know, we, we've been made part of God's family, but there's more to come. There's a hope for the future, right, you know, that... that our relationship with Jesus, Jesus' death on the cross and the forgiveness of sins isn't just about here and now. It isn't just good for however long we live on earth. It's a hope for the future. It's a hope for what's to come, knowing that whatever, whatever we're going through here that it, it'll pale in comparison with what's to come. And only the creator can provide that hope. Only the creator is powerful enough to give us you know, something to hope in, right? We, that's not, we, we can't fix it on our own. We can't get all of us together working as a team and fix it on our own, right? It is, that is God as creator, that is his power. And so just like Paul says, we, we, we put our, our hope and our trust in him as creator. And the, the last passage we're going to look at is, is in um, and so you know, we're, we're, we're covering that whole spectrum from Genesis to Revelation, getting little samples along the way. And you know, Revelation really gives this, this climactic end to the Bible, right? We, the, and in the first 20 chapters, right, we, we, we're, we're getting these little glimpses and descriptions of creation along the way and the fate of creation, right? And there's, there's judgments, there's all kinds of things that happen. It's, this, it's the fate of creation and God de demonstrating his power and dominion as, as this creation comes to an end, Right, and it's not coming to an end of somebody else's design. It's not an end that somebody else is doing. This is, this is God involved. This is God acting as creator and Lord over the earth. 
But after, after the final judgment um, in, in, in chapter 20 of Revelation, we get to chapter 21, and John sees something new. And I'm going to uh, just read from uh, Revelation 21, starting in verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write, these, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, to the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. So again, just like from Genesis 1, we talked about how, you know, the, the, and it was good, it was very good, that's repeated idea here. In these six verses we just went through, the word new shows up four times. So that should be, again, an, another clue that there's something that, that is important here that we're supposed to grasp, that this is something new. This is a new creation. This is the fulfillment of that hope that Paul talked about in Romans 8. This is what Isaiah was referring to as how God was going to bless and care for and provide for his people with new creation. And, and there's even words in there that, that tie back to um, I think it says, you know, it is done. It makes me think of Jesus on the cross. It is finished. And then even back to Genesis 1, when God is, was done with his creation, he completed it. And so it's, it's come full circle, right? And even speaks to it here. He said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, right? And you know, Alpha and Omega, the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. So Jesus is saying, from beginning of creation to new creation. I, I, I was there to start it. I'm here at the end of this creation. Creation and time as we know it, coming to an end. And Jesus says, I'm here. I'm doing this. And... Um, and, you know, from from the other parts of Revelation, we know that this, you know that this is Jesus talking about creation again, um, and all all that hope and that trust that we that we've seen from from Job t to Jesus on this on the sea to his disciples through Paul is coming to fruition here. Right, it's God God's work, Jesus's work as Creator can put their trust in him because it is done. All the, the pain and the hurt and the brokenness that came from the fall that Paul talked about in Romans 8, you know, that, that groaning of creation, and the groaning because of corruption, right, in creation, it's all being undone or remade in new, with new creation. All of those struggles, all of that pain, all that hurt, will be gone in new creation. And so as, as, we've, as we've kind of, we've gone Genesis to Revelation, looking at this, 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 this theme or this thread of creation, right? it's, it's important whenever we <laughs> read our Bibles, when we look at these ideas, that, that they don't just become a mental exercise. If we've studied for a test, oh yeah, I can tell you where God, where it talks about creation in the Bible, 
these things, every, it's what we read in the Bible, what we learn from it should, should change our lives. Right? We should change the way we live because of what we, we read in the Bible, what God tells us. And when I think about creation, and, and as, I, as I studied through this, there were a couple things that kind of stood out to me as I think about it. And one of them um, is that from what we saw in Job and is that God is involved in creation. God cares about his creation. And if it's something that God cares about and if it's something that God sees as worth his time and his energy, it should probably be a clue for us to care about it too, right? And the, the stewardship that we've been given of the earth as seen in, in Genesis in creation, God gives man stewardship over the earth. And if, and if God cares about the earth, we probably should too. Now, that being said, creation is a horrible God to make. And anything in creation is a horrible God for us to have, right? We want to worship the creator, not the creation, right? So, so, it's, so as, we, as we care for creation, as we care for the earth, it's not about worshiping the earth or making that creation is, the, is above everything, but, it, but it's that balance of, okay, well, if God is involved and cares about it, you know, this is, n- even though it's going to be destroyed, this is not a throwaway creation, right? This is not disposable. This is not, you know, and so I liked, uh, I was just I was doing some reading, I like how uh, uh, an author, uh, Gail Heidi, put it, of all people, evangelicals should be the first in line to teach how God's creation should be treated. What better way to demonstrate God's love for us than to show love for his creation, both human and non-human? And so again, sometimes you can get, we, we can get into this mindset of, oh, since this creation is going away, we, we focus on the future. We focus on that, that hope that Paul talks about and that, that should be there. But again, I think anything that God is willing to take time to be involved in it should something that should be important to us as well. But then also, right, again, as you saw, you know, creation goes from start to finish in the Bible. And the, the authors of the Bible, you know, in all kinds of different situations, different reasons for writing, different kinds of literature, they keep turning back to creation or looking ahead to creation. Right? And, and they see it as a source of hope, and trust. Trust because the God that we serve is powerful enough to create everything, powerful enough to sustain it, and a hope that it all, all that is broken around us right now will be made new in the future, and that God's people get to be with him in, the, in, the, in this new creation. Both Isaiah and Revelation talked about that, right? How God will be right there with us. And that there's this, this, this should cause really great hope to grow in the believer. Great trust in who God is as we think about God as creator. Right? He has not abandoned us now. He's not going to abandon us in the future. And, and I hope that the, the things that we've seen today give us that same hope and peace that we saw from, from these passages for, for our life you know, today, tomorrow, and the rest of our lives, that we can trust in God as creator, uh, God as sustainer of creation, and the God of new creation yet to come. Um, so I'm going to pray. Father, thank you for creation. We praise you as creator. You are awesome and mighty in ways that are so far beyond us. We want to find hope and peace in in, in you as creator. Uh, No matter what storms going on around us, no matter what brokenness and chaos we see, we want to rest in you, our, our solid foundation. So help us to, to remember that and, and to live it out. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm-hmm.